HVAC technicians take a lot of different types of readings. They can take airflow measurements, temperature differentials, motor amperages, uneven room temperatures, or superheat, subcooling, humidity control, system runtime, power efficiency, even noise that the system generates. All these things can come back to one number, and it's a number a lot of people don't even bother measuring, and that is static pressure. Now you may be wondering how this one number can tie into all those things and i'm going to tie that together for you today and we're going to start with why static pressure plays such a big role in all these different facets of a system whenever we try to heat or cool a home we're actually fighting against the amount of heat that the home naturally gains or loses while we're trying to condition the air if a home gains heat faster than remove it in the summertime, for example, the home's going to keep warming up even with the AC running. In the wintertime, if it loses heat faster than we can add it, it's not going to warm up at all. So to overpower that, we have to deliver enough conditioned air to take control of the space. We have to overwhelm these natural heat gains or losses. Static pressure is the resistance that pushes back against the blower's effort to deliver this required volume of air that we need. Every bend in the ductwork is a change in direction the air is forced to take. That's resistance. The spiral lining inside a flex duct creates drag. That's also resistance. The air filter, the tightly packed fins of even a clean evaporator coil, even the supply and return grills on the wall or ceiling. These are all obstacles the blower has to work against to constantly move the volume of air that is required to take command of the space we're trying to condition. Now the word static in static pressure doesn't mean that the pressure never changes. It just means that the obstacles creating that pressure are fixed in place. They don't move. The bends, the coil, the filter, the duct material, those things are always there. They're always pushing back against the airflow. Now the pressure itself can rise or fall depending on how much air the blower is trying to move. The harder the blower pushes, the more those obstacles push back and the higher the static pressure climbs. Now there's a lot of different ways we can measure static pressure and use that information to diagnose problems or set blower speeds when we're commissioning a new system. Typically when we want to set a blower speed, uh, first thing we want to do is take a pressure reading called a total external static pressure reading. Now I'm gonna dive into something I'm probably gonna get a little bit of hate on for. Basically, in order for you to know where to place your static probes of your manometer to get this total external static pressure reading, you have to read the manual, the installation manual, there's blower data charts in there. And you have to look at those first because when a manufacturer creates these data charts that we're eventually going to use to set our blower speeds, they perform their own total external static pressure test, and they don't all do it exactly the same way. When you see a video and they tell you, place your probe after the filter and before the blower housing and after the blower and before the evaporator coil, they may be right a lot of the time, but sometimes they'll be wrong. So let me show you what exactly I'm talking about here. If you look at the top of this performance data chart, you're gonna see wet coil, no filter, no heater. What this is telling me is that they included the evaporator coil in their static pressure test. And they didn't just include the coil, they included the coil when it was wet, which means the air conditioning was running, the humidity was condensing out of the air, and the unit was generating condensation, so the coil was actually wet. That water on the coil is another form of resistance. If you were to try to breathe through a dry rag versus a wet rag, you'll know immediately what I mean. Now, this chart also says no filter, which means they did not include the filter in their static pressure test. So in the case of a wet coil with no filter, I'm going to want to place one of my probes between the air filter and the blower casing, and the other one after the evaporator coil before the supply ductwork. And I want to take my static pressure reading only when the unit is condensing and making water. If I take my reading before it starts to condense, I'm taking a static pressure reading on a dry coil, and that's a totally different static pressure number. This chart also indicates no heater, and what they mean by that is that there are no heat strips in the furnace, for example, when they perform the static pressure reading. 
Now, to be fair, heat strips are probably not going to add so much resistance that your blower speeds are going to be way out of whack and you're going to have system problems. So if older guys say, you know, it doesn't matter, just go with the reading anyway, instead of pulling the heat strips out just to get a static pressure reading, as a new guy, just understand that's what you're doing so that if you do come to these conclusions, you at least understand what it is you're doing and not just blindly following somebody who hasn't explained anything to you. Now here's another example where the chart says dry coil. And so what basically that means is that if you're going to set your blower speeds in cooling mode, you want to do it without condensation forming on the evaporator coil. So in this case, what I would do is I would pull the disconnect on the outdoor unit because that compressor is what generates the cold refrigerant that our humidity starts to condense in the evaporator. So by shutting that off, I could run this unit in cooling mode at cooling speeds without the condensation. Once my blower speed is set, I can then run the outdoor unit and adjust my refrigerant charges from that point on. Now, if these data charts don't say anything about a coil, anything about a filter, anything about heat strips, then you're just gonna do it the way most people tell you. Just take that static pressure reading after the filter before the blower and after the blower before the evaporator coil. The only exception to that, I would say, is a one-piece air handler where the blower and the evaporator coil are in the same unit. They're not detachable. Um, in that case, I would just take the static pressure reading after the filter before the blower um, and after the evaporator coil. And I would also probably do it on a wet coil because that's typically what you're going to be dealing with with straight cooling. Now, the static pressure reading you read on the return side, that's going to be a negative number uh, because the blower is pulling. And on the supply side, that's going to be a positive number because the blower is pushing there. So if I had negative 0.20 on my return, positive 0.30 on my supply, I'm simply going to add those two numbers together, ignoring the positive and negative, And that total is going to be 0 0.50. And that's my total external static pressure. Once we have that max static pressure reading on our system, we want to get an idea on what our blower motor in our furnace or our air handler can actually handle. So this is a st maximum static pressure reading that the blower can push against and still move the required volume of air that we need to take control and command the space in the house. Now in a furnace, this is really easy to find. There's always a sticker inside the furnace that actually says max external static pressure in inches of water column. And as you can see on this sticker here, our maximum is 0 0.50. So on this particular unit, my static pressure on the system is 0.5. My blower can handle that static pressure up to 0 0.5. I'm within the design capabilities of that blower motor. Um, and I could still deliver the amount of air I need. Now, when it comes to air handlers, a max static pressure can be a little difficult to come by. They're usually not on a sticker inside the unit. Sometimes you might actually find them in the manual, but not always. Once in a blue moon, you might find it on a sticker of the blower itself, but that's pretty rare. Usually what I do in these cases is I just look at the blower performance data chart in the manual and the top static pressure reading in that chart I pretty much consider to be the maximum static pressure of that blower. Now this is gonna be our next step anyway. Once we have our max static pressure reading on the system, we have our max static pressure reading on the blower, we wanna to refer to these blower performance data charts and you can usually find these in the installation manuals of the unit itself. Now the first thing we wanna do when we look at these charts is we want to determine how our blower speed is actually set. So on this particular chart, you can see we have dip switch settings that determine our blower speeds with a series of switches in different on and off configurations. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to find these dip switch settings inside our unit and see how they're organized. And then we're going to look at this data chart to determine what blower speed that's associated with. Now, in some units, it might not be dip switches. It might just be different color wires landing on a cooling or a heating tab. Sometimes it just might be a number from, say, 1 to 18. With the higher the number, the faster the speed. But whatever the case is, we want to determine what the manufacturing default blower setting is set at first. The next thing we want to determine is what is the tonnage of our air conditioning if we're setting this in cooling mode. So let's say we're dealing with a two-ton system. So everything within this two-ton bracket is relevant to us. Everything outside of that, we're going to ignore. So let's say we found our dip switches in an off, on, off, off configuration. 
So what that's going to do is that's going to narrow this bracket down even more to this one single column going all the way across. Now we can look at the static pressure reading we got in the system. So let's say I got a static pressure reading of 0.7. I can now follow that column down from 0.7 to that horizontal column that our blower speed is set at, and that will give me my actual CFMs of air being delivered to the home. Now, once you have your total airflow, the next thing you have to determine is what CFM per ton are you going to use as a standard to set your blower speeds if you need to adjust it. So when we talk about CFM per ton, what we're referring to is how much airflow is delivered across the evaporator coil per ton of cooling capacity. Now the standard number is 400 CFMs per ton, uh, but that's not a one size fits all value. The right target depends on your climate, dehumidification needs, and the duct design. So typically 400 CF ton is the baseline standard. It offers a balanced mix of sensible and latent cooling, which means it can do a pretty good job of remuting humidity from the air, uh, but it can also drop that sensible temperature, the temperature you actually read on the thermostat. Now, in some places you might go down to 350 CFM per ton, and this is really suitable for really humid climates. Think Florida, Georgia, Gulf Coast region, uh, that lower airflow increases the latent capacity of the coil. So what that means is that it runs colder um, and removes more moisture from the air, but you sacrifice a little bit of sensible cooling performance in exchange for better dehumidification. Now, in other regions, you might use 450 CF per ton, and this is a higher airflow best suited for dry regions like Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico. Since humidity isn't much of a concern here, uh, you prioritize maximal sense cooling capacity. Uh, because the air is drier, the system can run at a higher airflow without compromising comfort. One thing you don't want to do, however, is use 350 CFM per ton in a very dry region. You're never going to get that temperature down. Uh, likewise, you don't want to use 450 CFM per ton in very humid climates. You're going to end up with that very cold, balmy feeling. But whenever in doubt, go with 400 CFM per ton. That's kind of a happy medium. Going back to our data chart here, if I was looking for 350 CFMs per ton, I'm looking for around 700 CFM. 350 times 2 is 700. At 400 CFM per ton, I'm looking for around 800 CFMs total. At 450, I would be looking for about 900 CFMs total. Now, in a previous example, I had a static pressure of 0.7 on a two-ton system with the blower set at a normal speed, which gave me 735 CFM. Now, if I'm going with the standard 400 CFM per ton, my airflow is a little bit low. Now, I can bump that speed up. Let's say I go to the high speed. I switch my dip switch settings here from off, on, on, off puts me in high speed and I retake my static pressure. Now remember earlier in the video when I told you when you increase the amount of air the blower is going to push, that static pressure is going to push back and the static pressure is going to increase. So by bumping up my blower speed, I may actually end up with a static pressure of 0.9. And when you look at the chart here, that gives me 751 CFMs. So even though I'm going from a normal speed to a high speed, I'm really only gaining about 15, 20 CFMs between that 735 and 751 because of that increase in static pressure. Now, at this point, I can see if that 751 does the job close enough to 800, but uh, my only option from there is to actually start looking for ways to decrease static pressure. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned how all the other different measurements we take on a system can be affected by these static pressures and change in blower speed. So when you think it through, let's say we increase our blower speed. What are we doing? We're increasing the amount of air flowing over the evaporator coil. So we're increasing that speed and that increase in the velocity across the coil is going to lead to less contact time between the air and the refrigerant in the coil itself. So you're getting less of a heat transfer. What that's gonna do is that's gonna lower the temperature of your air a little bit. So you're gonna see a change in your Delta T. At the same time, 
you're transferring less heat into the refrigerant. So the temperature of the refrigerant in your evaporator coil, for example, may drop off a little bit. And when you get a change in temperature, you also get a change in pressure. So essentially, you're changing the load on the refrigerant cycle. That is also going to affect the amperature of the compressor itself. When we change blower speeds up, for example, we see an increase in static pressure, and that can lead to greater imbalances in the duct system if it's not properly balanced. So a room that's already getting a good blast of air because it's a short straight run might end up getting more air where those rooms far away with a lot of twists and turns may actually end up getting less air despite the increase in the speed of the blower. So it has this whole domino effect across everything in the system. Now some of these are permanent. Um, for example, if we increase the speed of the air across the evaporator coil, we are starting to reduce the amount of humidity we can take out and it's going to stay that way. Now our supercooling and subcooling temperatures may change with these adjustments in blower speeds, but on TXV system, the TXV will reacclimate and readjust and those subcooling and superheat temperatures may return to normal without touching the charge at all. Whereas on a newly commissioned system, you wanna make sure you set your blower speed before you even think about adjusting the charge in your system. Because if you don't do that first, you're not gonna dial it in properly. Now, one last thing to wrap this up, I know I'm probably gonna get a few questions on this, but when it comes to adjusting blower speed on furnaces or in heating mode, uh, it's not really static pressure dependent. What we typically do is we adjust manifold gas pressures um, and then we adjust our blower speeds based on a temperature rise. So this is the increase in the temperature of the air when it comes through the return, through the furnace, heat exchanger, and coming out the top. That temperature difference, there's a data plate inside the furnace itself. Um, and we adjust our blower speeds to stay within that range. Uh, that's a whole new video. We can do that another time. But hopefully this helped you guys figure some stuff out about static pressure. I can make some more videos on this, maybe go deeper into the manual D kind of stuff, get a little bit more into duct work um, and static pressures and how to design a system. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes. But thanks for watching. Hopefully I'll see you on the next one.